of today's uh, uh, seminar, seminar, which is in fact a webinar, uh, because our uh, speaker today is rather far away on the other side of the pond. Uh, Tamara Kravchenko is uh, located now in, in Canada, maybe. Uh, at least she's assistant professor at the University of Victoria at the School of uh, Public Administration. Um, thanks, Tamara, for joining us and for the early st start of the day, I guess, due to the uh, time zone. Um, Tamara has been working on a, a series of and a set of uh, very interesting topics for us, which are uh, not only very connected to what we do in terms of research, but also what we do in terms of teaching. And I'm sure our students will, will, will greatly enjoy her presentation. She has been working on uniqueness of places. I like this term that I found on, on your page and the role of institution and governance and policies. Uh, I may say that you have been working mainly at the crossroad between political economy and economic geography. Does that sort of... Yeah, and, and I'm an institutionalist, yeah. Okay. Um, so today uh, she will uh, give a presentation on a topic which is becoming very central in uh, not only in academic research, but also in the public debate and policy uh, making, uh, which is this concept of of just transition. Um, and I guess she will connect uh, just transition with the broader framework of socio-technical transition. Uh, so I don't want to steal uh, too much time to you, Tamara, and I'll leave you immediately the floor. Uh, the rules of the games are more or less always the same. You've got up to one hour of uh, time for presentation, and then uh, we follow on with a Q&A session, which is kicked off by our students. Uh, with no further ado, Tamara, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, okay, is that the right view? Okay. Uh, so maybe, maybe not, because we see the uh, the 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 presenter. We see the notes. Ah. All right. Let me just see this. Then I'll do it this way. Oops. No. Um, just give me a moment to set this up. Is that the correct view for you? This is perfect. Okay, thank perfect. You. So I just, I can't thank you enough for finding me and having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, grazie per avermi qui oggi. I hope I said that right. Um, I uh, have done work in Italy because I worked for the OECD and the OECD has a center in Trento for spatial productivity. And, um, and so that's been a great opportunity to understand a little bit about the Italian context, but I hope to learn from you today as well, as much as I try and tell you about some of the research I've been doing. So today I'll be talking about how we manage a just transition to a post-carbon economy and the role of regional development policy. And why I call it managing is that I'm very focused, I'm in public policy and, and I do comparative work and this has been a concept that has gained a lot of attention and I wanna understand how it's implemented. I wanna understand how it's being delivered, um, who's involved, what it looks like and the mechanisms. And I'm joining you from the University of Victoria, which is on Vancouver Island. I'm on the Pacific, I'm really far away. And we in Canada are nationally trying to understand and, and move towards a, a relationship of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples in Canada. And it is very, perhaps this is uncommon for you to see in presentations, but we always open with a respect and acknowledgement of whose territories we are on. And for me, those are the territories of the Lekwungen peoples and that of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples. And um, this matters especially to me because I will say I'm Ukrainian Canadian and I understand what it means to have land taken from you. And on that note, I think that it is important to acknowledge what's happening right now there um, and the connections between Russia's war in Ukraine and, and fossil fuels and the need for a just transition. So just to quote, I mean, this week at the International Panel on Climate Change, Ukraine's representative to um, the IPPC, IPCC said, we will not surrender in Ukraine, and we hope the world will not surrender in building a climate resilient future. 
human-induced climate change and the war on Ukraine have the same roots, fossil fuels, and our dependence on them. And I think what we're seeing today is a, a need for um, colossal acceleration of this transition, hopefully in a just way. And I will, on a personal note, remark that this has probably been the hardest week of my life. And my sister is um, today a war refugee with her family, including three young children. Um, so I stand behind how important this work is and how we need a transition now and we need to decarbonize our economies. And this is a, you know, a, a massive project for us, including in Europe, um, especially in places like Germany. Today, I will talk about four things. I will outline a chal the challenge we face very briefly. I'll focus on Canada and contrast it to Italy, but I'd like to know a lot more about the Italian context from you. I'll discuss the Just Transitions concept and its main uh, precepts, and then talk about what I've found in a large policy review of how governments are implementing this, and then talk about what it looks like maybe to accelerate Just Transitions in regions and the role of regional development policies. And I have to acknowledge my funders for this project, which are um, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada that have supported me in undertaking this work. So this is what the challenge looks like in Canada, just to give you an example. What is Canada? We have a population of around, what, 40 million, um, really big country, very uh, diverse geography and diverse energy profiles. And Canada has committed to around 40, 45% GHG reductions below, um, below the 2005 levels by 2030, and also to net zero in 2050. We have never, ever, once, ever met any of these targets. So there's a lot of work to do. The majority of emissions are in the industrial sector. And particularly, we have these very dirty oil sands you may have heard of in Alberta, which are heavy crude and uh, very um, energy intensive oil to extract and uh, only really viable when the price of oil is above $60 uh, a barrel. And then we also have this um, important, this in industrial sector is also important. So it's about 11% of nominal GDP and about 2% of direct employment. So there you have it. It's a lot of GHG emissions, but it's economically important. And if you look at indirect employment, that number is much bigger. So in fact, industrial transitions are really central to meeting here in Canada, our climate commitments. And progress has been really, really slow. And I'll just say, if you don't know much about Canada, one thing that's important is that we are among the most decentralized, we are probably the most decentralized country in the world. And so while the federal government has purview over some policy mechanisms, it's really provinces that have control over energy policy and natural resources. And how do you coordinate across a very big country then when you have such regional um, uh, political decision-making. Just to give you an idea of what this looks like in the Canadian context, we have a lot of transportation emissions. People drive massive trucks here. They love their trucks and they keep buying more and more of them. And industrial emissions are around 30 36% of which oil and gas is around 17. And then you see agriculture in contrast to Italy is quite small. Um, and then we have residential around 13% and commercial um, institutional around 9%. So that's our general sectoral emissions. And I just wanted to give a quick snapshot of Canadian exports from the Harvard Atlas of Economic Complexity, which if you don't know that resource, it's fantastic. And you can see here, petroleum products are in the brown box and they're around 13%. And then if you look at ad coal and petroleum oils refined, it's even more. So it's a really big part of the economy. And if you were going to go back and look at the same snapshot of Canadian exports in around 1996, it, it is in fact a totally different economy. And the oil sector did not dominate in this way. And there was far more manufacturing. And why I bring that up in this context is just to show, because we're talking about transitions and economies transitioning, is that the Canadian economy has transitioned quite quickly in the matter of decades. It become, became extremely oil focused in its exports. And that is um, not you know, historical, that it has changed and that it can change again with the right investments. And 
I shared this slide, which is these are the provinces and territories of Canada, of which there are 13, and this is GHG emissions per capita. And I just want to point out that Saskatchewan and Alberta are disproportionately the major carbon emitters. So what does that mean from the perspective of regional development and regional policy is that they have a much higher stake in, in certain industrial activities, especially oil and gas, that efforts to transition the Canadian economy to a post-carbon economy need to focus their efforts there, and that there's a political um, you know, political geography here that these are oil and gas provinces. People have bumper stickers that say, I love Alberta oil in these conference. You know, there's a geography of discontent anytime the federal government tries to do anything or impose a carbon tax or anything like that. So these are our, you know, oil and gas supporting places and that a transition for these places will not be politically acceptable unless it's a just transition. So switching over to the Italian context now, let's look at the EU targets. There are of course binding climate and energy targets for 2030. There's a commitment to reduce GHG emissions by at least 40%, uh, to increase energy efficiency by a third and to increase the share of renewable energy by around a third and also to guarantee at least 15% energy interconnection levels between neighboring member states, which is um, really important and interesting. And in the Canadian context, I'll just say, we're so fragmented by regulation that in fact, provinces that have renewable hydro energy like Quebec don't share it. And the transition lines tend to always go down to the United States because it's a bigger market and they don't go across Canada. So we have really great um, regulatory barriers in the Canadian context. Now, what's happening in, a, in Italy? Well, you, you all can tell me much better. Um, I just started looking at these figures. I grabbed what I could find from the OECD, but these are 2008 emissions. And what we see is that transport is significant at around a quarter. And I'll just comparing Canada again, uh, remember in Canada, it was 38%. So um, transport is big here, but Canadian transport emissions are just way, way, way higher. And then we see that there are energy industries, including electricity that are around um, 22%. Clearly residential and heating is much higher than in the Canadian context, interestingly. Agriculture is a bit higher and manufacturing industries and construction are higher and um, industrial processes are, are much smaller. So what does this say about, um, you know, where to focus transition efforts? And forgive me for having a less pretty slide here, but I wanted to look at what does this look like in different regions in Italy? And this is from an OECD report, the Regional Outlook. Um, from 2021, and it looked, this is estimated regional greenhouse gas emissions per capita. And you can see that unlike in the Canadian context, there aren't huge differences in fact. And so I'd like to ask participants um, where the concentrations are and where the most challenging regions might be for, trend, you know, transitioning to a post-carbon economy, here we see there are some standouts like Sardinia and um, Molise and Basil Basilicata that are marginally higher, but we don't have anything like the types of really, really major differences like in the Canadian context. The key sectoral actions that the Italian government has identified are, um, first off, that it looks like they're going to reach their reduction targets and even exceed it, which is quite remarkable. Unlike the Canadian context, you're doing much better than Canada, that there are coal-based phase-outs by 2025. And that's a very specific type of sector transition. We have a lot of knowledge about how to manage those transitions. They've been going on for a number of years now. They happened in Germany early on. Um, there's a lot of knowledge about how to do that that there is uh, an emphasis on gas infrastructure and interconnections for baseload electricity generation, that there is an emphasis in Italy on hydroelectric storage, digitalization and smart grid solutions and buildings. So all of these energy efficiency work. And then in transport, 
to create more sustainable modal shifts and, and, and change how you move goods so that it's, you know, less carbon intensive. And, and that will get at that around 25% of carbon emissions. So these are kind of the big focus in your economy. And we can think about what that means for regional development and the types of place-based investments that might be needed to realize that. I did, looking at the geography and the per capita emissions and trying to understand what that would mean um, in Italy is one thing, but then there's the employment risks. And so in the regional outlook, there was a figure on employment in selected sectors that could be subject to employment losses by 2040 if emissions are reduced in line with the plant. Uh, Paris Climate Agreement. And here you see um, that there, you know, that uh, Ligurgia, and I'm so sorry for mispronouncing this, but <laughs> really is, is Liguria. important. Liguria. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. My apologies. That was butchering it. Um, really is a standout. And I'd love to know from you all a little bit more about why that is so large in the transport sector and what the implications of that are. And then you see others like Lombardy and Piedmont and Tuscany and so on that are, may also be important, but more with manufacturing and uh, chemical and plastic products. So these seem to be some targeted sectors. And then we can think about, well, what does it mean in these regions to have, if these are employment transitions, how do you manage that process in a, in a fair and respectful way? Okay, so that's a little bit about what it looks like in our two countries. I'd say Italy is doing a little bit better than Canada. Um, you know, we have a lot of work to do. We're in the red. Um, we have a highly extractive economy. We don't do a lot of value added and it hurts. Uh, and that I, I would say Italy is a much better placed, especially with the types of policies that we're seeing coming out of the EU to support transitions. What does it mean to have a just transition? Where did this concept come from? Well, it was really pushed in the American labor movement in the 1970s, um, as there were large scale industrial transitions to really say, you know, we need support from a union perspective to manage this process. It's not fair that employment bears the brunt. Some of the structural factors that were creating these changes were like global shifts man in to manufacturing in, in China and other places, but it also stemmed from, in some cases, the environmental movement and a need to reduce um, toxic and highly polluting industries. So it had both. And then the term, you know, we hear it so much today, it became globally prominent in the context of the international climate negotiations and the Paris Agreement, and it's really continued to gain momentum. And in that context, it's really been broadened. And so while this had union origins, um, it seems to be used by a whole bunch of different groups. And in a sense, there's this growing interest in the idea of just transition and measures that we understand the value and importance of it and how we might support workers and communities. But then when you get down to what that actually looks like on the ground and you talk to different stakeholders and right holders, you find that it can be a contested concept. And why that matters to regional development policy and, and a regional framing and place-based policies is that the interpretation of just transition actually differs a lot depending on where you are. I'm doing a project right now in Ireland um, with Iris researchers looking at how we do, um, what just transition means in specific regions. And it's very different across different regions. They have different um, economies, different profiles, different fixed assets, and they all view just transitions in a really different way. What do we mean by justice in a just transition? Well, there's generally, um, this is a reproduced by Bennett Blythe and uh, Cisneros Montemayor and others, their work on just transformations to sustainability. Generally, there's about you know, three different ways of interpreting this. You have recognitional justice where you need to identify and differentiate between rights holders and stakeholders, acknowledge that they have these rights, and then think about what their stakes are in this process and, and what existing institutions and knowledge systems are there to interact in this topic and also the diverse worldviews, perspectives, and values. So who are who are the people who have a stake in this? 
procedural justice is about how you then include them. Like, how do you facilitate participatory, transparent, accountable planning and management to transition an industry or economy um, or a place? And how do you make sure that that the institutions and policies and managers and other systems are seen as legitimate in the eyes of these people? And then how do you create appropriate decision-making processes? How do you support local capacity in these issues? And how do you ensure that stakeholders have access to justice and conflict resolution? And, And that looks really different in different places. Then there is distributional justice. So how do you distribute the costs and benefits over time and the space in space in between groups in terms of how this transitions are actually felt by individuals, workers, community members, um, rights holders? How do you design fair compensation and mitigation mechanisms? How do you adapt um, to improve social and distributional outcomes? And this is the political, this is a political question, right? You've seen so much, um, a growing literature on geographies of discontent, on on the fact that if we decarbonize our economies and move to this, what is really quite a rapid transformation in some cases, and we don't think about the impacts on people and communities, you risk really, really disenfranchising people. In Canada right now, just for context, we're having these giant, you've probably seen them, trucker convoy context, uh, um, co- like protests, and they some of them want to overthrow our government. And it's ostensibly been about COVID-19 measures, but it's really not about that. It's about a whole bunch of other things, including, including um, the oil and gas sector, actually, and, and, and feeling of being disenfranchised from political processes. So these Geographies of discontent are are really fundamental um, to this element of uh, distributional justice. And there's a gender element here, especially where you're looking at male dominated industries in extractive industries. So what do we mean by justice and and for whom? And I've done this deep dive and into all the literature. And I think that there are three kind of ways of thinking about this. You have the job centric focus. And I've, you know, with, if you talk to people um, from the union movement, they just say there can be no just transition unless it's unions negotiating. Jobs have to be at the forefront of this. This is where the policies should focus. Um, but then you also have more society centric interpretations and advocacy groups, and they really want to have a much broader idea of what a transition means for the whole economy and society and and come come at it from a social justice lens. And then you have the environment centric ones who are really focused on how we can transition to a post carbon economy and they're less focused on on what that means for workers. And I I bring this up because when you bring these groups together and I, I just we just had a national conference on just transitions in Canada there were very different ideas of what justice means and how to move forward on this topic. And there were cleavages between the groups, between the environmental NGOs, between the unions and the labor movement, between those who are focused more on social justice more broadly. Um, And and if we're gonna push forward these ideas that there needs to be some common understanding between these groups to navigate that. Okay, moving in. So how can we actually manage a just transition and what are just transition policies anyways. Now, I'm gonna try to answer this question in a very specific way, in a way that I went about methodologically doing this. So I just wanted to understand, well, what what does this look like? Who is actually doing this and where are they doing it? So I looked for these policies in the places and regions that have experienced a transition, thinking that if anyone's gonna have them, it's them. So I isolated sub-regional economies something below a region, according to the OECD database. Um, And I found, I isolated those that have had a quarter share of industrial employment because industrial employment is highly correlated with carbon emissions. And that that in places where that's declined over 20 years, um, so they had high emission, they had high industrial employment, and then that declined. It's because I don't have good uh, sub-regional um, GHG data, so I couldn't do it another way. I'm using that as a proxy. 
And I focused on OECD economies. And based on that analysis, I found that there were 26 countries, 74 regions, and 130 subregions at the nuts uh, three level that correspond to this type of shift. So these are um, economies that I can say have transitioned. And what did this look like? You know, this is not perfect. This is one way of isolating cases. In Canada, the, um, the TL3 or NUTS3 level corresponding doesn't work so well because we're a big country, but basically the dark blue are the transitioned regions that have these features. The, um, the middle blue are high industry regions, and then the light blue are growing industry regions, and then the the, the white ones are low industry regions. And there's, there's some problematic things in larger countries with how you do this analysis, but this is what we isolated. And this is North America and you can see Mexico there too. These, um, here we have Europe. And if you look at Italy, you can see there's quite a few transitioned regions and high industry regions in the North. Um, and then in the south, it's more low industry regions. And I think that that has to do a lot with more diversified economies, with a large services economy, with potentially tourism and so on. But you can tell me better than that. Um, we also see a lot of transitioned regions in the Baltics um, and in northern Spain. And then here is Korea, Australia and uh, Chile. So taking all of this together, Delving into all these places, trying to figure out what these governments did. This was a deep dive into all of their websites, looking at all of their policies, digging around. And this is what we found. And I'm giving you like what this, this, this work constructed a very large data set that I can't really reasonably share with in Excel. And, and so summing it all up and bringing out all of the thematic content, this is what we found that just transitions were being interpreted around this subset of policies. So there were six main policy areas plus mm -hmm. governance mechanisms that appear to be very important in how these processes were managed in these places. The first were climate solutions, of course. So what are these? These are all of those different climate policies, strategies, targets that um, include binding net zero GHG commitments, they include mitigation and adaptation programs and talk about often investment in clean tech and energy transition funds. Those are um, important to just transition. They often mention just transition. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about what this looks like um, later on. Then there's all of the workforce development, the skills, the employment strategies, the training, education programs, job databases, um, labor market information. This is a big piece of work that's important to Just Transition. This is how Just Transition has been long interpreted, and especially from the labor movement, this is the focus. And so we have a lot of labor market policies, um, active labor market policies that are important and that engage with the idea of a Just Transition. Also important and what stood out among all of these diverse countries are economic development policies and strategies, industrial transition commitments, business and tax incentives to transition, sector specific initiatives, and then SME and entrepreneurship support. When it comes to regional development, there are, of course, strategies and plans that engage with this idea of a just transition regional development programs like in, in the European Union, rural development program, infrastructure investments, and then community resources and investments and spatial planning and land management, although I'll get to this not as much as you would think. Social security in, in, exists uh, in some places to address just transitions. This includes temporary and financial support for displaced workers the use of the social insurance and unemployment support programs, and in some places, pensions and early retirement for specific industries. And I think this has been, this has been used in Spain. I think it may have been used in Italy as well. Then there are these industry 4.0 measures and including digital infrastructure upgrades and funding for research and higher education. And then in the darker blue, I have governance because this is like the glue that holds all these policies together. These are efforts at multi-level governance coordination, stakeholder collaborative tables, coordination offices and hubs and places that are experiencing transitions, and then a whole variety of consultations and public engagement. So 
This was what we saw the focus of just transition policies. Interestingly, have not seen a lot of focus on agriculture. Um, I think, you know, we did this work about a year ago. I wonder if now if we redid it in Europe, we'd see more of that coming because of the just transition mechanism. But um, this is kind of the big picture view of what we saw. Oh, and I need to, spark, I need to speed this up. Um, <clears throat> just to give you a few examples of what some of these policies are. Well, in Canada, we had a just transition for Canadian coal power workers and communities, and that was a federally led initiative. And there was funding for transition centers in impacted regions. And that was seen as a pretty effective strategy. It didn't have a lot of community engagement though. So from a regional development lens, it was a little bit top down. Spain is interesting because they have just transition agreements with territories experiencing coal mine and power plant, and nuclear power plant closures. And what's really interesting about these is that they are in agreement with the unions, with the region, they are place-based, they are targeted. And this is looks like a very good regional development um, model for how you would manage this process. And I do want to mention um, some countries like Denmark, where they're having, you know, an all out oil and gas phase out commitment. And they're part of the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance. And they have a raft of policies to support that process as well. And there are others like I'll, I'll talk about New Zealand, which has um, committed to an offshore oil and gas um, phase out in a sense. Now, of course, the European Commission's just transition mechanism, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. This is really, really important. And what it aims to do is mobilize $150 billion euros through direct EC contributions and matching funds to do three things. One is to use the Regional Development Fund and the Social Fund um, to, to, to push forward on just transition initiatives. And then this invest EU scheme that provides uh, financing for different targeted projects and, and then a new loan facility through the European Investment Bank. This is big bucks. Um, you know, when the European Commission puts in place a mechanism like this, it's like there's a whole, there's a whole focus um, on it. And there are now national, every country needs to have their own national plan and, and distinct sectoral plans. And this is going to put a lot of efforts and it'll be very interesting to see how these funds are mobilized particularly the Regional Development Fund and targeted. I just wanted to give you an example of how, like what these policies look like playing out in a specific region. They can be very different. I recently uh, did a deep dive into the Taranaki region of New Zealand because this is a place in New Zealand that has a lot of offshore oil and gas. And the, the government has committed to saying no more permits for offshore oil and gas drilling. This isn't a lot of employment. It's less than a thousand people, but it's actually around a third of regional GDP. So it's really important economically. So what do you, when you have a, an example like that, well, how do you manage a process like that? You know, it's coming, it's going to be a phase out. I think what was really excellent about what New Zealand has done here is that it's proactive. They have given a lot of lead time. They set up a just transitions unit within the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment to manage the process, to have a dedicated team. They established a regional dialogue on, with all of the key players, including the Economic Development Agency, um, the Indigenous peoples, the EV, um, the Maori, local and central government and businesses and unions and workers to talk about like this transition is coming, this is what our economy looks like today. And this is what we see as our assets and capabilities and where we need to go. And on the basis of that, they had a wide ranging dialogue, which really put meat to how they interpret just transition for themselves and what it could look like in their distinct regional economy. And then they developed 12 action plans that they are implementing to deliver on this. So that's that's a very, very um, bottom up regional development approach that is, uh, you know, really well based in the New Zealand context. So bringing it all together, what does this look like and what are some of the lessons in all of this and, and how these things work together? I'd like to focus on the gaps um, in what we saw. And the first is that 
when you look at all of the various climate solutions, you typically equity considerations are ac absent. Um, the exception in a lot of these strategies is you, you tend to see funds to mitigate energy consumption costs for low income households, some things like that. But other than that, there's not a broader understanding of or recognition of how this is going to affect the broader economy. Um, in terms of workforce development, this is the most or skills or active labor market policies. This is most often common policies. We see them used. We kind of governments know how to do this. Um, however, they tend to target workers and not communities, and they're not often targeted with other initiatives. And that's a real limitation. In terms of economic development, I think what we see is a lot of steering and not rowing. And why I bring that up is that rapid transformation may need much more interventionist policies and even public sector ownership in some cases. And that if you think about how this plays out in different regional economies, you have some places that have more diversified economies that have um, you know, assets and capabilities to manage a transition and others that are gonna need a lot more assistance or risk a geography of discontent um, and, and growing into regional inequality. And one thing that we see with a lot of these economic development strategies is that there's very little recognition of how to manage stranded assets and the, the risks of those assets. I'm thinking here of how um, the, the, the lignite regions in Northern Greece, for instance, um, that that has been really, really slow to be recognized. Regional development, a lot of regional policies are being branded as just transitions. And I think that we need to question to what extent they really are. And I've seen this criticism coming out of the just the, re, the use of regional development funds with the just transition mechanism presently in, in, in Europe. Um, is this a new green industrial policy, but what are the actual equity measures within that? And the EU is gonna be the huge test case here. We're all looking at what they're doing. The community level seems to often be really absent in a lot of this. The social security system among the different countries we looked at, it's really underused. I think that we've seen over the pandemic how much can be achieved uh, and targeted with our social security systems. For society-wide transformations, we need to rethink how we use these and the role of the pension system in particular when there are target industrial transitions um, this needs to be rethought and much more attention should be placed on what pension reforms could look like in that, in that case. Finally, Industry 4.0, um, these policies are envisioning this economy of the future. There are sometimes branded just transition policies as the solution, but the links to social equity are really weak. So I think there needs to be a lot more thought about what the justice part of Industrial 4.0 policies are and how not to leave people behind. And that is linked to workforce development. And then finally, in terms of governance, co coordination mechanisms are often absent and they often are reactive and ad hoc in their interventions. And we don't see a lot of proactive strategies. Um, and I think New Zealand was useful in that case because they are proactive, but generally we don't see that. So these are some of the gaps. Another gap I really forgot to include here, but want to emphasize is that how, how do we use land? What is land as an asset? How is land impacted? Um, what is the role of spatial policies in managing a just transition? That is part of regional development and spatial, the spatial policies seem to be so absent in connecting with this topic. And, and that's a major gap um, and something to focus on. So lots of work to do. So some of the key issues, just to wrap up, is to think, like, how is justice really addressed in these policies? Importantly, what are we transitioning to? How do we understand that? And what are the right policies to manage and support that process? Uh, what is the right scale to manage different transitions? Um, so we have examples of top down versus bottom up. And the type of transition should determine what those governance institutions look like and how that process is managed. Then there's the whole issue of how these things are coordinated in government and how you give a big picture view. So we tend to have the climate strategies coming from a particular part of government, poorly connected sometimes to that, the broader range of policies that I mentioned. Um, so where does this sit at as a coordinating function in government? And in New Zealand, 
you know, they've created a particular unit. In other countries, they have created just transitions commissioners. So in uh, Scotland, they have a new permanent just transition commission that is going to hold government to account. They also have a new minister for just transitions. So um, it's a junior minister, but anyway, there you have political accountability. So how do we embed that and coordinate that in government is a big question. And then finally, what does this look like in regions and what is the role of regional development policies? And I've given some indication there of what can be done and also the gaps. And if we're going to accelerate this and actually meet our objectives, especially in a place like where I live in Canada, we absolutely have to have uh, territorial cohesion policies. And regional diversity is a strength here because you have places with different assets that can help each other with different energy profiles. Regional development policies investments um, are absolutely needed, particularly in innovation systems, and that there's a bigger role for government in the left behind places probably so that we manage this geography of discontent. The Just Transitions platform, I just wanted to mention it if you're not familiar with it, the European Commission's Just Transitions platform is a, a great place for, for policy learning and there's a lot of expertise being shared there. And I wanna emphasize the need for new approaches to regulation and in particular land use management um, land, 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 spatial planning and policy have been so absent from this. Um, there's much more that can be done. And, and to leave you with a final thought, which is how can we make action on climate change, the central organizing principle of public administration, if we're going to actually pull this off. So I will now stop sharing so that I can see you and I welcome a discussion and comments and questions and any of your thoughts and anything you can tell me about Italy. Thank you very much, Tamara. Thanks for the very interesting talk. I will detour a little bit from the usual route and uh, hand it over to Alessandra, who couldn't be here at the very beginning. Uh, she wants to salute you and welcome you. Oh, well, great. Hi. Hi. Hi, Tamara. Nice to see you again. Last time you we kind of blocked my at the OECD uh, event. Um, yes, sorry, mm -hmm. I was slightly late because I had another meeting, so I joined you, but I, I was here for the beginning of your presentation, so I actually followed on your presentation. I just want to thank you for being here with, with us today. I actually didn't know you were of Ukrainian uh, descent origin, so of course, you know, I just want to express uh, the solidarity of all our uh, group to what's happening right now to, to Ukraine. And, and also, uh, again, to your sister and everybody, uh, we are also putting in place uh, some programs to host um, uh, refugees, uh, especially academic that might need some, uh, you know, uh, visiting or anything else uh, um, here in L'Aquila. So anyway, we, we can't do much, but we are trying to do at least a little bit what we can do to help. And, you know, good luck to your sister. We all sympathize, of course, with what she's going through and her family as well. Uh, and again, thank you very much for your presentation. It was great. Now, I pass the, the floor to Alberto again, because it's our tradition to let younger people start with the discussion rather than older people, or I should say more senior people. So Alberto will actually lead the discussion, but thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation and for being here. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your solidarity. It gives us hope mm -hmm. and uh, it means the world. And my sister has a message. Um, Ukraine will persevere and she expects to go back and help rebuild the country. And that's her message to everyone. Ukraine is okay. well. <laughs> I surely hope so too. Yeah. Pass her this message from us. Thank you. Sorry, my I, the sun has come up here. I didn't have to close. It. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good sign. Go. It's a good sign. <laughs> um, oh gosh, it's still. Too yeah, it, it's <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thanks, Alessandra, for 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 these nice words, uh, which I completely join, and obviously also the rest of the faculty. I'm sure. Thanks. Uh, Thanks for that, and uh, thanks for the presentation, Tamar. Again, uh, as Alessandra was uh, mentioning, um, we generally give, and I was mentioning to, uh, to you before we started, so we give priority to the students uh, in case they have questions. Um, we have a, a, a good representation of, of them here in, in, in the audience. So 
Dear I, students, I also have please a question. Go with the questions. <laughs> I mean, I have a question too for your students, which is what does, you know, what does just transition mean in, in Italy today? And, but also what does it mean within the regions that individuals are from? Because as I said, it can really differ. So okay. <laughs> just to start. This, yeah. Hi, Carlo. There's Carlo over there. Um, Carlo, uh, first stop is yours. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay, um, hello, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. I really enjoyed it because this is um, a very hot topic, we can say. I don't study and I don't work on this kind of stuff. So I don't have a real question, um, but rather a, a comment. Uh, first of all, uh, in Liguria, I guess that is uh, a lot of wheel transportation because of its uh, morphological problems. So, you know, a lot of... Uh, high mountains on the back and uh, and this it's difficult to reach by train every single place and little places and uh, my question my comment is related to the dichotomy between uh, places left uh, behind which uh, uh, gives the origin to a lot of the discontent that academic is now focusing on and the role of people because in the end of the day what uh, uh, can be understand uh, from your presentation is the centrality of uh, people so of course there is the place that can can provide some problem to the policy implementation but the, the main focus is um, should be on people because if you transform the transportation sector to let's say um, the train uh, transportation uh, this could be a simple decision, but uh, what do you do with all the people that are working in the wheel transportation? So this is um, a very hot um, hot topic for the next uh, future. Thank you very much again. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm curious Mara, how... Do you, do you prefer to answer this question or do you want to collect more? Uh, up to you. Oh, I sure. I mean, just a quick... Uh, my answer is more of a question is, you know, a lot of a lot of countries are now doing in-depth modeling to try and understand the scope and scale of employment shifts. And then I'm sure Italy is doing this as well and developing and, and doing, um, you know, a basically an inventory of skills and, and trying to understand among those individuals that are most at risk and the skill set, what types of training or up skills upgrading or transfer can be in place. Um, and so that that seems to be the approach to deal with that question. And but we have a big question, which is what are we transitioning to? And yeah, and 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 that's the broader question is, you know, in 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 that in that region, what what will employment look like in a decade or two decades? Okay. Uh, Alberto, can, can I add something to, to, to this point? With uh, sure. I, I, that there's someone saying that um, the problem that our societies are going to face in the next future is that the technological advancement will run faster than the sociological or social better one. And this is, the, I guess, the same problem that, that you are talking about. So where, where are we going? Uh, what is uh, the, the, the shape of the future that we are facing? Are we able to manage the technological advancement that is a blessing, of course, at the same time in this uh, sense? And uh, how can we shape the role of policy uh, in this sense? Probably the most important part that you mentioned is the cooperation, so the inter-sector cooperation, because um, economic and social, demographic and all the stuff has, has to be considered at the same time, probably. Thank you yeah. again. Thank you. That's a great point. I've got Andrea lining up for the next question. Andrea? Yes. Can you listen? Okay. Yeah. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Tamara. Thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. Uh, yes, first, I agree with you by the question about what is the just transition, because I also think that it's very place specific. For example, I'm from Latin America studying in Europe and the concept, uh, uh, for example, for us is more, I think that is more move from minority or really 
agriculture intensive activities and here in Italy or in Europe, the concept is different. So I think that it's also very important to make this different uh, when we talk about transition. And the second one is um, if you uh, see the uh, of any work, mm, the relation between just transition and the environmental climate justice, because there is a very interesting initiative that maps uh, every like climate uh, conflict um, and how the the people helps to to solve or, or to I don't know to to take uh, part uh, on the discussion. I don't know if you see some some initiative that mix uh, both uh, like literature or or narratives. Uh, yeah. The there's a and 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 that and this I would interpret that as coming from there's in those concentric circles that I showed about the focus on just transition. There's a big focus on from the environmental side, but also the broader social justice realm. And there's a connection between the two. And I think they're mobilizing in the. It's also um, very much connected to recognition of indigenous peoples' rights in countries that have indigenous peoples, of course because they have so been disproportionately harmed um, by extractive industries. Um, so absolutely lots of connection, lots of efforts at mobilization and lots of efforts by environmental um, NGOs in different countries to create umbrella groups, to come together on this topic and start pushing governments for concrete action. Um, that's happening in Canada right now. On, on agriculture, I just wanted to mention, so I'm doing a, agriculture is really interesting because I'm doing a project in Ireland right now, 35% of their emissions are from agriculture actually. And so just to disentangle what that looks like um, in terms of how you manage a just transition, you have the government's commitments that, and to decarbonize at the same time as you have the Ministry of Agriculture has a plan to push for more carbon intensive agriculture. So they are pushing for more dairy and meat um, production in Ireland. This is an example of how we have sectoral policies working against one another um, in delivering outcomes. I don't know if I answered your question well. <laughs> are you satisfied, Andrea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good, thanks. Uh, I think I've got in order uh, Anna Lisa and then Fernanda. Anna Lisa, please go ahead. Sorry, I was not admitting. No, thank you, Tamara, also from my side for the really extremely interesting topic and also for how you connected the current situation and war, what's happening to the just transition that we are in phase of. Actually, I was working before joining the PhD program in an organization that was dealing with climate and just, transi uh, just transition in uh, southern and central eastern Europe. And what I found that's extremely complex was the topic on the multi-level governance of this. Uh, and also you mentioned about the right level of uh, institutional care about the transition, because in particular where you were mentioning Western Macedonia has been where I focused most of my attention. And there, there was this situation of the government at national level declaring the complete phase out of lead night in 2028, but no scheme by the region that was completely not understanding how to make this happen. And then when I was discussing with the community, what was raising as the main issue was not so much the, the transition itself on the industrial level, but the identity. So they were all saying that this region is characterized by an identity connected to energy and connected to the night, to the, to, to the coal. How can we transition to other jobs? We cannot make all of them agriculture or tourism people as they were thinking of uh, those people and also the connection to, to the risk of the population. So the fact of being in the most rural area, so Western Macedonia is being the only region in Greece without the sea. So how they can stop people migrating if you are also closing the energy. So I found this super interesting in terms of how you can actually find the, not only the best you do need of analysis, but also the multi-level governance as a model to try to overcome this issue. So I was really wondering on profiting of your presence of what is your opinion about that? Yeah, thank, thank you for bringing that up. I, when I, I worked at the OECD for a number of years and we did a project on Greece um, and we met with 
all the regional governors, including from Western Macedonia, and talked just about this, about the, the issue of the lignite region. Um, let's be clear, it's been very mismanaged. They knew this was coming for a long time. There were declines. There was no regional development plan. There has been no spatial plan that talks about the fact that this is such a large territory of assets and what how to transition those assets at a at a spatial level, but also an economic level. Um, and what you're speaking to is that process of, of local and regional engagement. Um, and the model seems to be like the model of how to do this successfully is to convene regional dialogues amongst a broad swath of civil society actors, governments, uh, NGOs, businesses, and, and stakeholders and rights holders and workers and unions to get them the chance to really, first of all, grapple with the fact that this transition is happening and have a chance to grieve, for one, about that loss of identity. Um, so for instance, in Canada, we've had town halls uh, um, managed for oil and gas workers because we're already seeing transitions there and they need to have a, a chance to come together as a community and actually grieve and be angry. That, that is actually an important, important part of regional development. And then to take that and then to have dialogues and develop um, social and community consensus around what their assets are and their opportunities are for the future, to have a, a really strong vision and ask to upper go level governments for what they want. And, and again, I think that there are, you talk to people in, um, in that region in Greece and, and, they have ideas and they just have not been supported in realizing them. And they, you know, they have a vision of, of what the future could be. And, and they need, they need, they need support to deliver on that. Um, so that, that seems to be the model of dialogue. And I, I do emphasize though, the, that social element of having a chance to grieve around identity. It's, it's important. It's sociological. It's a part of the transition process and it's a part of understanding justice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's such a such important work <laughs> that you're doing. Thanks. Thanks. Fantastic. And now I've got uh, Fernando. Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. It was super interesting. I have a question because you mentioned that there seems to be like a trade-off. Yeah, like unions, like this. Well, it resounds to me a lot because I'm Mexican and it's also a, a very extractive economy. And they sell this speech of it's either jobs or we have a sustainable development, no? And my question is more like, do you know if there is any kind of transitions in the labor market? Are they aiming for green skills or whatever that means, no, in, in the context? Yeah, so it's really different, in, as you imagine, in different countries. I think... Um, Samantha Smith, if you know her, she's the head of the Just Transition Commission for the, the I'm forgetting the name of it, but the big international union. Um, and they have a lot of resources on this. They, they are asking for very specific things to manage this process, one of which is to have an inventory of skills to understand the, the extent to which af active labor market policies are needed, and then very specific um, obligations from government, for instance, with public procurement. So um, to, to, to make sure that if there are any large infrastructure projects or anything like that, that there is a very strong link between who does that work and the existing labor force that is experiencing declines, employment declines. So I think what we're seeing are legal and regulatory mechanisms and asks and agreements between unions and governments that are much more specific than they have been in the past. And also specific asks around how early retire, um, pension, uh, how public pensions can support early retirement for workers who um, are, are close to that and for, for whom reskilling is not a possibility. Thank you. I don't know that I fully answered that, but um, that, that's what I'm seeing coming down the pipeline and the types of asks I'm seeing from unions. 
in terms, I'll, I'll say one more thing. In terms of the context, so, um, if I may, you know, in some cases, we are already seeing transitions. They're just happening. Canadian oil and gas sector, for instance, has gone through a period of capital in investment and it's pushed past that. And now there are large employment declines that the government is not managing and not recognizing. People graduating from oil and gas hydrology degrees are not getting jobs. And if you look at the types of training programs across North America, oil and gas training programs are declining because there's no employment demand. Governments have often been really, really slow here. So these transitions are happening. Why are they not being recognized? Um, you know, some of it has to not to do with environmental regulations. It just has to do with the phase at which the industry is at anyways. And oil and gas workers in Canada in a recent poll have said, yeah, they support a transition. They don't care what job they're doing. They just want to have equivalent good jobs. And that's where those negotiations between unions and governments are really important in creating those set asides and procurement, man, you know, mandatory procurement contracts and stuff like that. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. Do we have uh, Boris? Boris. Okay, thanks, uh, Tamara. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Um, it's far from my field of expertise, but I was wondering about uh, the interplay between the way greenhouse emissions or the environmental footprint is measured and the notion of the, of the justice and transition. Because the way I see it from your presentation, we were uh, looking at the regions which are like industrial, in the industry-based, or those which are heavily dependent on the uh, car transportation. Um, so I was thinking that we uh, measure the greenhouse emissions by the, um, from the place where they are emitted, not from the perspective of the value chain and the footprint, for example, in the biggest cities which consume the products of the industrial regions. So they are contributing to it. So I was wondering whether in your research you have came across um, the idea of cross-financing the transition in the industrial regions from the regions which consume and actually probably contribute much more to the environmental problems. Yeah, the 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 tier three emissions, the source. Yeah, this, that work is coming. I think we're going to see way more of that, and that we are going to see transfers um, related to that, and some some more progressive countries that are progressive in the sense that um, ahead of the game are already talking about accounting for those source emissions and um, and doing that work. I think that's the next phase and that in the next decade, we're gonna see way more of that. And it's tricky and complicated and yeah. And, and you know, uh, environmental advocates like Greta Thunberg are always bringing this up and pushing governments on that. Um, on that front. So yeah, it's a great point and it's coming, I think. We don't, a lot of places don't even have basic good emissions data. Like we don't have in Canada, we don't have good local regional GHG emissions data at all anyways. So in some places like we're, we're really far behind. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, do I have other students? Raising their hands. Apart from boys, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, okay. So I, I think I can open the, the Q&A also to the faculty members, um, regardless of their age. So even if you're very old faculty members, you can ask your question. <laughs> No, I want to see who goes first. No, jokes apart, yes, the floor is open to, to everyone. Oh, trying to... Can I make a question? I have a question. Oh, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. No, it's uh, it's very Google. simple and... Uh, okay, I, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm a... Um, Faculty member here at the Justice High. I'm a, an economic and political geographer. Um, my name is Ugo Rossi. Uh, hi, nice to meet you. And my nice question is very simple, uh, straightforward in a way. Um, 
I will ask uh, uh, what is your, your opinion uh, uh, about the, the current uh, geopolitical tensions, how they will uh, uh, impact. Of course, it's a big question and no one has the answer. Uh, but uh, as a, you as an expert uh, um, uh, and also someone who is interested in uh, in the in Eastern Europe and uh, I think you can provide us with uh, some answer and uh, some insights and uh, yeah. what would be the impact and over the perhaps the medium term at least uh, of this geopolitical uh, of this war. Uh, in Europe and on uh, uh, the energy transition, if, if it will accelerate in a way or it will make things uh, uh, more complicated. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's uh, a great it's, question. It's, <laughs> it's I wish a, I, yeah. You know, I, w- I wish I had the answers. I, I think a couple of things. I mean, um, Russia has been using its oil politically for a very long time. Um, they have they have shut off energy supplies to to put pressure on governments, and you know that was never a good energy supply. So there is a huge risk in in taking energy from authoritarian. Um, and in this case, fascist governments, and that risk should have been understood. And and government, you know, Germany in particular should have understood that and was extremely complicit in taking that energy when they knew, I think they knew the costs and they knew the risks. Um, Russia will shut, you know, they will shut down pipelines when they don't get what they want. It's very dangerous. I think, um, and I I think anyone would say this, that, that this need, you know, now we're seeing major commitments to accelerate this transition from oil and gas. Um, and this is going to put a lot of pressure to make new investments. And then in places like North America, the increase in the price of grass suddenly makes North American oil and gas um, much more attractive. And so in the Canadian context, it's problematic because we, you know, we're trying to phase out the oil sands at the same time as if the price goes up that high, it's suddenly a very, very viable um, form of energy. So it means different things in different places. But I, I, I do not believe in a future where we support um, ethno-nationalism, fascism, war, um, white supremacy, um, and that, it, that this is a reckoning of values. And these values are about what ideas define the future. What ideas do we want to define our future? And, and that relates to energy and, and our relations between um, states. And I think that the future that we want is one of um, you know, compassion and environmental protection and democracy and respect for sovereignty and human rights. And it's time to stop being hypocrites. This war has been funded by my own government. My own pension funds have been investing in Russian oil. So we need to divest and pull out and, and, and make Herculean efforts to invest in the right things. And it's time to stop being such hypocrites. Um, that's my highly, you know, I have a certain view on the world and, and, and that's my view, so. Okay, thank you. Uh... Boris, sorry. Boris, go ahead. Uh, bless you. Uh, so I have an easier question, uh, I think. But um, you mentioned that the, the um, special policies uh, in, um, in the just transition are a missing link. And I want to ask if you found like, a, or you have an example of a special uh, initiative, special policy. Uh, that could aid the just transition, because what came, comes to my mind is that um, urban planning can help only a bit, in a sense, like transport-oriented development or redevelopment in former industrial areas, which is pretty common. Um, also, the BREAM certifications are now moving towards master planning and neighborhood planning, which is a nice thing, but they are, these are like, you know, small initiatives. And uh, I was wondering whether you came across uh, something more tangible. Yes, 
Thank you. That's an easier question. <laughs> and Ugo, I'm sorry for being so political on the other one, but that is my worldview and I stand by it. <laughs> There's no future in imperialism. Um, so for spatial planning, absolutely. Let me tell you about um, the audacious moves in the Dutch planning system. This is just one example, but they're doing something really interesting. So several years ago, the Netherlands adopted an act on, uh, what's it called? It's called environmental and spatial planning. And what they did is they took 22 acts, all acts that deal with envir the environment and all acts that deal with spatial planning and put them into one act and created an entirely new planning system that is being rolled out and implemented basically this summer. It was delayed because it's complicated. And this is what they're moving to. They're moving to a system on governance on the basis of environmental values. So statutory spatial planning has is extremely rigid. And what land use planning typically does at a zoning level is it creates um, allowable uses and it hopes that those come to fruition, right? That's very slow and it can be countered within the planning process. So you you create a you know you create a vision, you say we're going to give these allowable uses and you typically hope that the market delivers on that or in some cases you have um, a little bit more government intervention. The Netherlands adopted this new spatial planning framework for a couple of reasons. One is that post 2008, during the recession, they were extremely slow in being able to make new investments um, because of the environmental um, planning process. And secondly, that they want to allow much more flexible, innovative uses of land that correspond with environmental and social objectives. What this means is that because you're moving to a system on governance on the basis of environmental values, the, they're going to have one entire database for the whole country, which contains all environmental and land use information and environmental value information. By the way, this includes noise. So um, regulation by noise values all the way down to the local level. They are going to lift zone, traditional zoning in a lot of different places, not in historical parts that require strict zoning, but in more flexible spaces to allow innovation and development on land. This changes the role of the land use planner to one of regulation and ongoing conflict management, resolution, coordination, um, uh, and evaluation on what's happening with the environment. And there are a lot of great examples of what can be achieved. One of the things that we find in a lot of places is that there are colossal barriers to new energy systems, new forms of um, remediation, environmental waste management, and that this system can then accommodate that because it's not saying if you have this plot of land, you have to deliver infrastructure in this way. It's saying, if you have this plot of land, you have to meet um, these thresholds for environmental protection and values. And that changes the game entirely. So I was commissioned, we were in the OECD, we were asked by the government of Netherlands to look at this new governance mechanism and provide advice on how it's gonna be rolled out, looking at other places. And we weren't able to do that because no one else is doing this. I find it very creative and I just wanted to share that all with you. It's something to look at. Um, it's very unique. All right, thank you very much. I actually have seen a summer school in Groningen about this, this system and I didn't know what was it about, but now I know. So thank you very much. Cheers, okay, thanks Boris. Uh, any, any further questions um, for Tamara? Alberto, may I? Of course, you can, Sandra. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't raise my hand. So, Tamara, thank you, thank you very much. It was a really interesting uh, talk. Uh, I got a question uh, which may be amounting to rephrasing something you already said uh, more explicitly than what you have done, and and it has to do with the justness implication of a twin transition about which there's a lot of emphasis, at least in Europe nowadays this story basically that the digital transformation should serve the digital transition and the, and the two should go together, right? Uh, the question that I have is, although you already touched this thing implicitly, is whether um, the, say, alertness 
to the justice implication because of this twin transition should be larger than they are nowadays. Uh, because I mean, the, the, the green transition per se already poses a lot of uh, concern in terms of justice. I'm wondering whether when governments try to try to combine the two together, right? Given the uh, negative externalities of digitalization on the one side and those of uh, green transition on the other side, we have a sort of you know terrific explosion of justice implications, which sh which might require more attention, more policy attention than what has disposed up to now. I would like to know what you're feeling about that. I feel like you feel. I feel the same. And having read a lot of those 4.0 strategies, I was just struck by how absent the idea of, you know, the, that they mentioned just transition with no meaning. It's very unclear what, what the intention there is. And I think this speaks to, to a good, you know, good just transition policies and practices really put meat around what, how you measure that, what justice means. And, and that's just, work that needs to be done in those 4.0 strategies and other digitalization strategies. The, there's an obvious connection when we talk about rural broadband. And I know that in Europe, there's been a lot of work on rural broadband, like that, that makes sense. Um, but for some broader innovation focused policies, it's just not clear to me what those mean for a just transition at all. Okay. Um, other questions? I have a question for you all. Okay. Um, what is your level of like optimism about, about how Italy is managing its decarbonization, decarbonization agenda and its impact on, you know, diverse peoples and communities? How, what kind of grade would you give yourselves um, in managing this process? Uh, I will leave it open to the audience to, to answer. Hugo is admitting it himself, so maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 in my opinion, uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. In, in my opinion, uh, uh, Italy, well, now with the, at the official level of public policy at the government level, uh, there is a lot of emphasis on uh, decarbonizing uh, uh, what is called in, in Italy the, and Europe at large, uh, the so-called ecological transition. <clears throat> uh, but it's seen more in a kind of, uh, this is my opinion, uh, technocratic uh, way of uh, uh, kind of boosting the, the economy uh, rather than uh, uh, being uh, like serving also the needs uh, being an of uh, low income communities and uh, uh, underserved uh, areas and so for instance we we have uh, uh, we have a policy for uh, making more uh, uh, sustainable the buildings, uh, kind of a state, very generous state subsidies, uh, but uh, they're not uh, aimed uh, at uh, uh, public housing complexes. Uh, this kind of energy, uh, as they're called, uh, energy interventions for upgrading the buildings. Uh, so the, I, I think the social and the ecological uh, are still uh, kept uh, very separate. There, there, there is no awareness of the fact of bringing together social inclusion, uh, social equality goals with uh, environmental uh, policies. Mm -hmm. I think environmental policies are still pursued in, in a quite uh, pro-growth manner, basically. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. my opinion. I don't know my colleagues uh, if they uh, have different one. No, similar, similar to that. It, it happened to me for different reasons today to go through, you know, this periodic monitoring that, that every country in the EU has about the extent of uh, implementation of uh, European environmental policies. We have these periodic reports in which each and every country is basically evaluated against the objectives of you in terms of environmental goals. And as far as I've seen, I mean, 
we are not doing that bad, okay? Uh, I mean, we are lagging behind in, 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 in many respects, uh, but in some other, we are doing well. So my impression is that we are proceeding in a, in a quite scattered way, so to say. Uh, for example, if you, if you take a circular economy and, and transition to circular economy, which, which is quite an imperative nowadays, in, in, in some indicators, we, we are among the best countries, right? Uh, productivity of resources, for example, but while in some other we are we are lagging dramatically behind, like in 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 research, and 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 innovation in circular economy. So we are quite scattered in the different domains. That we in, in some areas we are doing quite well, in some other lagging behind. And on average, if I can express a grade, you say the grade that we are doing relatively well, I think. That's Tamara, okay. I'll give you my opinion as well, which is not very different from what Sandro and, and Hugo said, except that I wanted to add something that is happening in Italy in the last uh, year, basically, very recently. So there has been, uh, we have a national plan for recovery and resilience after COVID, right? And uh, now twin transition, uh, circular economy, uh, all these kind of uh, topics became the focus of the national plan of recovery and resilience. So on one Side, there is going to be a lot of money that is going to be spent on this, which should be a good thing. Uh, but having been involved uh, with politicians in the National Plan for Equality and Resilience, because the money needs to be spent very quickly, because we need to spend all this money by 2026, my answer is not as optimistic as it would have been maybe before in the sense that I think on average, we were not doing bad, uh, but I'm very worried about now decision being made very quickly. Uh, yeah. And so there's a lot of money. This could speed up uh, our process and be positive, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I, it's kind of ironic that I'm less optimistic now that there is a lot of money than before when we had less money. I'm a little bit worried that now we we are uh, we might not really go in the right direction just because we are in a hurry. And so I agree with what Sandro said, with what Hugo said, but uh, uh, I, just a little bit of a warning now about uh, trying to do these things too quickly. So this is my mm. thing in the last, you know, few months. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, co I'll come make a small comment on that. It's, um, I need new windows in my house. And uh, there's a government program that will support energy efficiency. The requirement for efficiency is so high that they're only the most expensive windows that um, qualify. And as such, only very high income people purchase these windows. Therefore, that energy efficiency program is essentially subsidizing wealthy people to have nice new windows. These are the types of things that you can roll out fast and poorly with bad justice outcomes. I just, that's a, such a tiny example. And yet we see that replicated again and again and again in a lot of different policies. No, I totally agree. And what we are doing right now, we have a lot of money that is rolled out, but for instance, small municipalities have problems applying for the grants or for the money compared to maybe a little bit bigger municipalities, right? So you talk about justice in individual terms. Because I'm a regional economist, I'm thinking more in terms of territorial justice. Mm -hmm. also, you know, you, you did talk about redistribution, right? Among people, but also among places. And uh, uh, I can see that there's little absorption capacity of smaller places towards some of these goals, right? So unless you give them uh, a lot of help, uh, they are under risk of being left behind even more than what they already were. Absolutely, so, yeah. There's another okay. question, uh, Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would have liked to jump in in this discussion, but I will remain neutral as a chair and I'll leave the floor to Alessandra. <laughs> Alexander, Hello, good morning. Um, first of all, thank you very, very much for this very interesting presentation. And 
um, very, uh, well, for this very moment, very, very important. Um, I wanted to add a comment and uh, ask you two questions. The first comment builds on what Professor Fajanja said about this uh, national plan for resilience. Um, one thing that I, I, I don't know if you address in your definition of just transition is the generational impact, meaning that sometimes justice is also generation wise. Um, so thinking how not in the, you know, not in a sustainable just uh, way, but also looking uh, beyond that. Uh, as you know, this program that we are implementing in uh, Europe is called Next Generation, and sometimes people forget what we are leaving our children, what kind of world we are leaving. So I, I was wondering whether you thought about it in uh, defining the just transition. Um, and two uh, sort of um, ideas maybe on, uh, on the work you're doing. Um, you um, said you will look at what the Just Transition Fund mechanism, um, the European one, will uh, sort of produce in Europe. And I was wondering whether you took into account the fact that the JTF will actually not go everywhere, but just in specific places. For example, yeah. in Italy, all the two sites were selected. Um, so how will you take that into account? And another question uh, regarding some of the policies, uh, say, for example, the pension policies you mentioned, um, because I was wondering how come you got so different um, results in Italy for, in this particular case, when these policies are actually nationally driven, not regional policies. Um, so these were my two questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, on intergenerational equity, yeah, I'm, I'm actually writing a book on intergenerational equity. And I think that a lot of the problems we see today are because we discount the future in our policies. And, and, the, and that any notion of just transition has to, of course, gauge, engage with intergenerational equity and intergenerational effects. And that looks really different in different places. And um, in terms of the JTM, uh, yes, there's, you know, targeted regions, and then how do we manage that? And you've already seen a lot of discontent um, in different places around which regions were left out of that process. Uh, I didn't get into this, but I'm I'm really looking at which policies are being put where, and and then thinking about the capacity of those places as well. Um, where do we need more state intervention? Where can things be more bottom up? And therefore, how does governance differ? in different places to deliver on these object objectives, I think is a big question. And, and that is certainly a challenge with the, the JTM uh, and the use of regional development funds um, because other places could certainly use this money as well. And are we picking the right places? Um, and then the final question, uh, Alessandra was, I'm sorry was regarding the fact that some policies are actually national policies, not regional policies, to understand the difference that you found in different regions, for example, in Italy, yeah. because we know better. <laughs> yeah, I just, what I what I did is I just collected the data on typically pension systems or national. So, but what I see is that um, even national policies have place-based impacts. And so, when, for instance, we've had specific pension programs for the cold transition, those have been, they still are place-based because that coal transition is happening in a specific region. So I'm looking at the interplay of national policies, including sectoral policies that have place-based impacts. So I'm always interested in how they, um, how they play out in, in places and whether they're adequate in that regard. And yeah, that's an important um, really important point. There are some national policy levers, and then there are often much fewer regional ones, in fact, to manage this process. And then regions that have very different capacities, what is the role of the national government in supporting those regions? It's like saying that we can do this massive transition of an economy, particularly economies that are so, um, that are not diversified, that have large indust industries that require transition. To, to imagine that they can somehow pick up their bootstraps and manage this process and, and think of an alternative is just unrealistic. And so um, in my work, I would emphasize that the national government needs to be much more involved in those cases in supporting those processes, engaging community members and working with local governments um, to make real meaningful investment. And the risk is 
the real risk is to leave places behind that will tear apart um, that will tear apart polities politically. Uh, that hence the political dimensions of just transition um, and political acceptability. Thank you very much. Thank you. Those are such great remarks, and it just goes. Er, there's so much work to be done, right? Um, I've only scratched the surface, and I, and the the thing I'm working on next, my big project is the politics um, and policies of just transitions in economies that are highly oil and gas dependent, because I think that that is one of the trickiest things that we don't know how to manage. That's what I'm going to be focusing my efforts on in the next year. Okay. Um, third questions. Yeah, the discussion has been quite lively so far, so let's see whether there's more to be added. Oh, any students who want to use the priority at the very end of the discussion, faculty members, last call, last drink. Okay, Tamara, are you happy with the, with the discussion? So yes, far? and such a pleasure to meet you all and hear about your context and uh to learn from you as well I, and then and again just thank you so much for having me i really appreciate it okay well then uh thank you for for joining our um, seminar series and for the very interesting talk and also for the nice discussion uh, so thanking also the students and the faculty for that so if there's no remaining pending issues, uh, I would close the session here. Uh, thanks again, Tamara, for joining us. And again, please uh, accept our sympathy and thoughts for the situation over there and in Ukraine and family. Thank you. Solidarity, everyone. Okay. Never come visit. I live in a beautiful part of the world. I'd uh, love to meet you. <laughs> I've been there, Tamara. I've been to Victoria. Oh, you've been? Oh, nice. I know Canada quite well. It's a nice place, though. I, I mean, I wouldn't mind coming back, and I suggest that the others come and visit because it's a really beautiful place. I'll cook you dinner if you ever come. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. That's a very good uh, excuse to come then. Okay, thank you, Tamara. Okay, take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.